day when Jesus conquered sin and death, defeated darkness and fear, and bathed the world in stunning resurrection light. May we ever live to reflect that light to all whom we meet. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is Christ the Lord is Risen Today, found on 302, and we will sing all six verses.
right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the day of the Lord. Amen. I invite you to join with me as we proclaim our Easter statement of faith. It's found as an insert in your bulletin. It's a responsive reading. You will read the bold, and I will read the regular prayer. We believe in an amazing God who surprises us on Easter morning who has the last laugh on evil, who never gives up loving or working for our good, who weeps at our good Fridays, and who transforms our fears into hallelujahs. We believe in the risen Christ, not stuck in a tomb of despair, nailed to a dead-end future, or buried in the past, but alive, available, and willing to walk with us in the ups and downs, and ins and outs of our journey. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy, invisible presence, the divine wind of hope, joy, comfort, peace, and possibility. And we believe that the world is colored with wonder and hope. This we believe. Amen. Susan, Catherine, Susan's brother's 
bill received some pretty hard health news this week, and we live Douglas Gray, Christina's dad, and her family. And we lift several unspoken needs to our God this morning, needs that were brought to my attention this week, needs of some of our own faith family as well as friends in the community. We lift this morning those who grieve this Easter day, those who have lost loved ones in the in the recent past, and perhaps this is the first Easter. Those milestones are often so hard, but yet today we rejoice in that loss because they live as our Christ lives. We lift the violence in our world, especially that in the Ukraine, and we lift our nation leaders, our world leaders, and our spiritual and religious leaders as well this morning. Are there other needs that need to be shared or joys this morning? I will share a joy that it is so wonderful to see some faces here that we haven't seen in a while. So just welcome to your faith family. What a blessing that is. Other joys can come quickly. Testing season, mercy. I, yes, all, all prayers for both teachers and students and families. Almighty God, God of the resurrection, we gather this morning celebrating and rejoicing in your power over sin and death. What a day of joy this is. We give you all thanks and praise that you are a keeper of your promises. The promise to be steadfast in your presence in our lives, never leaving nor forsaking us. Your promise to for our needs here in this life as well as preparing a place for us in the life yet to come. We thank you for all that you provide for us, food that fuels us and homes that protect us, water that hydrates us and air that fills our lungs, for family and friends who journey with us through the highs and lows of our lives. For this church and this church family that provides us a place to fellowship and worship. For all these things and so many more, we give you all thanks and praise. Lord, let us never take any of these gifts for granted. Help us to make ourselves aware of just how blessed we are. And now, Lord of light and love, Lord of hope and restoration, we lift to you the names and places that were shared moments ago, shared as worries and concerns. We lift to the burdens that we did not share aloud, names and places and situations that weigh on our hearts and our spirits. We lift them to you now in this moment of quiet stillness. and every one, dear Lord. Care for each as only you know best. And we ask that you release their stranglehold on our lives. Give us an abiding peace and assurance that you will care for each one in your infinite power and wisdom. And now, Creator God, we offer to you our own individual lives. Shape us and mold us into the disciples you would have us be. Replace the darkness within with your light. Remove the doubts and fears that hold us back and replace them with an unshakable faith. Restore our spirits to ones that can't be quiet or sit on the sidelines. Instead, stir us into action. Empower us, challenge us, take away our excuses and our burnout. Renew our desire to be all that you would have us be. Truly ignite a fire within us. Unsettle us in a way that can only be calmed by being a faithful disciple. Let this Easter 
celebration be the first step in our new life with you. And then let us be agents of change in the world outside those doors. Lord, let that all be so. And now, God of all grace and mercy, we join our voices in prayer as we pray the most perfect prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of faith is found in your hymnal on page 310, and we'll sing all three verses of He Lives.
shakes with the force of the conclave, and the sun refuses to shine. For there is not sun in the balance, and there through the darkness he cries. It is finished, the battle is over. It is finished, there'll be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, and Jesus is born. Yet in my heart, the battle was raging. No prisoners of war have no more. They were battlefields of my own making. Didn't know that the war had been won. Then I heard that the king of the ages had fought all the battles for me. And the victory was mine for claiming. And now, praise his name, I am free. It is finished, the battle is over. It is finished, there will be no more war. It is finished, the end of the conflict. It is finished, and Jesus is born. Yes, it is finished, and Jesus is born. When it comes from the Gospel of John, I'll be reading the first 18 verses of chapter 20. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the foot. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them.
them that he had said these things to her. The glorious story, the word of our God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, how good it is to rest. So much has happened since we were last together, since Friday evening when a few of us gathered here to experience the horrific suffering and death of Jesus. Hopefully, if you did join us on Friday evening, you were able to spend some time yesterday resting and processing and thinking about what you experienced. I bet that's what the disciples did. After the events of Friday, it was probably good for them to have some quiet time to try to process all that had happened. What they saw, what they heard, the jeers of the crowd, the mocking, the abuse, the tearing of flesh with whips, the sounds of nails being pounded through their teacher's flesh into a hard beam, the mockery of a crown of thorns, the darkness, the earthquake, the word, it is finished, the smell of death, the hopelessness of their leader, their teacher, their brother, their friend dying a criminal's death. It must have been so overwhelming. So I bet in a way it was good for them to have that Sabbath day, that day of rest, to hide out, to detach from the horror that they had witnessed, to have some time to think about all that on their Sabbath, that Saturday, the second day after Jesus was crucified. Oh, sure, we all would much rather talk about the third day, the day we celebrate here. But that second day, that quiet Sabbath day, it was important, too, in its own way. The disciples, no doubt, needed that day to try to come to terms with the way things had played out. It certainly wasn't what any of them had expected. And getting over the shock of realizing that Jesus was dead was going to take some time. What would happen now? They had no leader. Peter could step up and take over, but he was just as devastated as the rest of them. Even more so, perhaps because of those final hours. And then the disciple that Jesus loved, John, maybe he could do it, but he'd been sticking all awfully close to Peter's side. Everyone huddled together in shock and in fear in that room behind locked doors. A room filled with hushed whis whispers and, and loud cries. A room filled with questions and maybe even anger. A room filled with hopelessness and fear. A room filled with gloom. A room filled with darkness. Each one of them grieving. Each one of them trying to figure out, what do we do next? Most scholars pretty much believe that for the first hours anyway, and perhaps through the night, somebody would keep watch because they were in fear of soldiers coming after them. Sometimes trying to sleep or eat, standing watch. Maybe a few stayed up and talked long into the wee hours, trying to decide on some course of action, but in the, in the end, no one knew. Most every 
everyone probably at some point because of the exhaustion and what they've been through the last few hours, they probably dozed off at some point. And no one probably even noticed Mary slipping out while it was still dark. And that's what I want us to hear this morning. Easter began while it was still dark. Hear that? While it was still dark. Yes, Easter leads to light, but it begins in darkness. While it was still dark. Easter may ultimately be But it begins in things that are low and dim and dark and murky. It begins while it was still dark. And so while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene finds just enough light to find her way to the tomb. Now in John's Gospel, we don't know why she went. He doesn't tell us what she intended to do, but I suspect that it was to mourn, to weep, to try to feel close to her teacher. As I picture Mary that morning, I see her walking slowly, despondently down that pathway to the tomb. And she might have been dragging her feet, shuffling along with no sense of energy, just barely putting one foot in front of the other. But then again, maybe she stomped along, kicking up dust in anger and frustration for all that had happened. But either way, her posture was probably low. Perhaps her head was down and her, her shoulders stooped in grief. And as she draws near to the tomb, she looks up and she sees that the enormous rock had been rolled away from the entrance. Imagine the alarm that must have swelled within her like a brush fire. She was probably instantly terrified and filled with questions and, and maybe panic even swelled up inside of her. It's obvious to her what had happened Someone had stolen her teacher's body. I think that because John tells us that what she did next was run. She ran to alert the disciples of what had happened. She runs for help. There's a lot of running in this story, but it's mostly frightened, confused running. It's not running like you're skipping along, running with joy in your steps. No, it is scared, chaotic, dark running. Now, Mary is the only one mentioned in John's version of this story. The other Gospels record there were other women there with Mary. Matthew says that Mary Magdalene was accompanied by Mary, the mother of James. And Mark also says that Mary, the mother of James, was with Mary Magdalene, but he adds another woman, Salome, one of Jesus' disciples. Luke, though, doesn't name any women. He simply says, the women went to the tomb. But back to John. Even though no other names are mentioned here by John, we get the sense that there were other women with him with her because she says we don't know where they put him. So Mary must not have been alone. Other women must have been running along with her as she raced back to tell the disciples what she had found. I can just imagine her bursting in where the disciples were hiding out in fear and exclaiming loudly and probably breathlessly from running telling them that the stone covering the tomb of their beloved teacher had been rolled away. Mary cries out, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. The disciples certainly 
certainly would have been startled and away. Suddenly confused and maybe dazed, but Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, we know to be John, they didn't hesitate. They jumped to their feet. They bolt from the room and they run to check out Mary's shocking story. And they run along, kicking up the dust on the pathway, their cloaks billowing around their feet. And the scripture tells us that John outran Peter. But being the cautious one, he stoops and stops at the entrance. And he stoops to look inside. But Peter, y'all know I love Peter. Peter, impulsive Peter. Reckless Peter, boisterous Peter. He doesn't miss a beat. He plows right past him and rushes headlong into the tomb. And he sees the place where Jesus had been, but all that's left are the linen wrappings. The linen cloths that had once carefully wrapped their teacher's battered, lifeless body. And so John follows Peter in. And he sees the burial linens too. And verse 8 tells us that when he sees the empty burial linens, he believes. But just what does he believe in that moment? Was it that Jesus had been raised from the dead by some miraculous power of God? Many think so, but no, that's not it at all. Because verse 9 makes that clear. John and Peter didn't understand that that was a possibility, much less believe it. Verse 9 reads, They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So it seems likely that what John believed was the story that Mary had told them, believing now that Jesus' body was missing. But he probably had maybe a belief that something fishy is going on here. Maybe he believed that his teacher's body had been stolen out of some horrific joke. No doubt, though, Peter and John probably look at each other in confused days of looks of wonder on their face, and, and without a word, they turn. simply says, they go home. Now before we condemn them for their lack of faith, or even for their short-term memory loss about not remembering Jesus' own words to him, to them about being the resurrection and the life, we might want to stop and consider how we too often walk away from things we can't explain. When our view of God is challenged and when things don't work out and God doesn't work in our lives the way we think God should, how often do we give up and walk away? Muttering and complaining to ourselves and oftentimes to anybody around who will listen. If we're honest with ourselves, we probably aren't much different than Peter and John. But then Mary pops back into the story to remind us that there's more than one way to miss out on recognizing the miracle of resurrection. She must have run back on the heels of the disciples because here she is again now weeping as they walk away probably wanting to see what they saw, she, she too stoops and looks inside the tomb. And she sees the very same burial cloths, the linen wrappings lying there empty. And she discovers something else, though. That tomb is no longer empty. It was empty moments ago, but now there's two. Not one, two angels sitting where Jesus' body should have been. And they asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? Now to us that would seem like a ridiculous question since she's standing there, grief 
grieving the loss of her teacher and now grieving the loss of his body, a tomb is normally where people would weep. But they know something she hasn't quite accepted yet. Mary is still stuck in the he's dead mentality. She's stuck in the reality of her own limited understanding. She has not grasped the impossible fact that Jesus is alive. And so she can only answer, they have taken him away and I don't know where they've laid him. And then as she turns around, she sees a man standing there. And the man asks her the same question. And her answer is another repetition of her theme, I don't know where they've taken him. She's stuck in this quagmire of grief and confusion, believing that Jesus is dead. And she says the same thing she's been saying all along, first to the disciples, then to the angels, and now to this man she doesn't recognize, the man she figures must be the caretaker of the gardener. But then the most amazing thing happens. The man says her name. And probably in a way she heard many times. In a way that was so filled with love. One simple word, her name, just two syllables is all it takes for this sheep to recognize her shepherd's voice. And honestly, aren't we sometimes like Mary too? Like we said, when God doesn't fit into our neat box of the way we think should happen or, or the things that we believe, we might just walk away like Peter and John did or we might act like Mary, senselessly and stubbornly repeating what we think to be the truth, even when there's evidence to the contrary standing right in front of us. We think we have it all figured out and we know. where we started and talk about that darkness. That darkness that swallowed up the disciples on that Sabbath day when they were locked behind doors in hiding, hiding out in fear. And that same darkness that Mary walked through that morning to the tomb. How many of us feel we are living in some degree of darkness. Probably most everyone here. Maybe it's the darkness of illness or grief. Maybe it's the darkness of an uncertain future. Maybe it's the stress of a job or chaos in our home. Maybe it's the darkness the unending bad news that you hear every time you turn on your news. The war in the Ukraine. Yet another new variant of the coronavirus. The rising cost of everything from mortgages and rent to gasoline and eggs. The housing market crisis family struggles, financial worries, so much uncertainty and worry and fear and darkness. It can truly become overwhelming if we let it. But let me share again those key words from the very first sentence of our text. While it was still dark. Darkness. That is something we have all lived with over the last few years, two years especially, and we continue to live in it these days. The darkness of uncertainty.
But the fact is, she went. And she went even while it was still dark. Mary could have very well done what the disciples did. And that was to run and hide. Close herself off from the world and allow the darkness to rule her thoughts and her actions. But she didn't. She went out while it was still dark. For whatever reason, she went. She did not allow the darkness to win or rule her life. She did not allow the darkness to consume her. She stood up to the darkness. She faced the darkness and took it head on. Mary's Easter story began in the dark. And y'all, so does ours. Mary found the light, the light of the risen Christ. And that light is the same light for us too. Yes, there is darkness right now. A lot of darkness. The darkness of all that's going on, but we need to look toward the light. The light of resurrection. And focus on that light. And let that light guide us. Let that light fill our thoughts and our minds. Let that light fall upon us and
surprised with what God will do next. Look for the risen Christ in those you meet. Let the Holy Spirit nudge you and guide you. The tomb is empty because Jesus is out 